Welcome back to Learn SKN. And today we're going to continue looking at CSEC economics. And we are looking at the syllabus right now. And what we're going to pick up from is objective number 13 from section 2 in the syllabus. And this objective covers the concept of economies of scale, both internal and external, and also diseconomies of scale, diminishing returns to scale, and those things. So we're going to cover section objective 13 in section 2 of the CSEC economics syllabus. All right, so let's just jump right in. Let's not waste too much time. Jump right into this thing. We're going to look at a textbook here. And the textbook has an entire chapter dedicated to economies of scale, this economies of scale and this economies of scale. So what exactly is economies of scale? So according to the textbook, economies of scale are the cost advantages that accrue to a firm as the firm increases in size. So again, it's the cost that advantages that accrue to a firm as the firm increases in size. So let's, let's, let's simplify that a bit. What this is simply saying is that economies of scale are those advantages that, that a firm obtain as they get bigger and they start producing more as output increases. There are certain advantages a firm gets when it grows, when it becomes bigger and bigger than it was before. So that's what economies of scale tend to describe. The advantages that a firm accrue when they get larger. And of course, we can look at the definition here again, where we say economy of scale refers to the property whereby a long run average total cost falls as the quantity of output increases. So now for this to make sense to you, you'll have to go and listen to the long run versus short run video that we did earlier as we look, we're looking at production. So you look at that video and this complements that video. So because we're talking about long run and short run again. So economies of scale is a long run phenomenon. So this occurs in the long run, not the short run. So economies of scale refers to the property whereby long run average total cost falls as the quantity of output increases. So let's 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 layman terms that again. So economies of scale simply refers to the advantages or the fall in the the, the, the average total cost. Remember, 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 we look at cost before. We look at average cost, total cost, fixed cost, all those things. But in the long run, we said that all costs in the long run are variable. You know, fixed cost in the long run. So, economies economies of scale refers to the total average cost as it goes down as the company output increase as the business grows. The variable cost in the long run begins to decline. It goes down. But the opposite now, the flip side, is this economies of scale that refers to the property whereby the long run average total cost rises as output out increases. So what I'm saying is that as the firm grows, as it becomes larger, the, the actual variable cost, the long run variable cost actually goes up. And you know, you know that's a bad thing. You don't want your cost to go up in production. That's a bad thing. So this economies of scale, bad economies of scale is what you're trying to aim for here. We get advantages such as a fall in the long run average total cost as your output increase. Constant returns to scale, as I said, constant is where the cost basically stays the same as the company grows, as it becomes larger, as it, as its output increase, as it produces more and more, the cost the long run average cost basically remains the same but for economies, economies of scale the total cost that's an advantage and it falls as output increase this economies of scale is where the long run average total cost rises as output increases and it can all be summed up in this wonderful graph that you might encounter on a CXC question or two all right so let's, let's break down this graph now as we said before the long run average total cost curve is u-shaped even the short one one is u-shaped these blue ones are the short one short one short one whereas this red one is the long run average total cost curve and this one is u-shaped u-shaped refers to the fact that it first at first you realize the cost is going down as output increases the cost is going down then you have constant return to scale where the cost remains the same for a while 
across certain output levels but then the cost starts going up the long run average total cost starts going up and this point of the graph represents this economies of scale the middle section the flat section refers um, refers to constant return to scale whereas the point where uh, costs move from 12,000 to 10,000 you see costs dropping that is economies of scale so really certain advantages the company gets as their output increase so again let's run to this graph again this graph is a representation of the average total cost in the short run and the long run the short run is the blue ones and as you can see short all right over a short period of time this is this is a firm right here now as time go on the firm's cost can change at first it goes down as output increase and we're gonna look at that later then it levels off and then it starts rising as output increase so economies of scale is where the cost the long run total average cost goes down as output increases and the constant is where it stays basically the same and the economies of scale is where the to the average total cost in the long run actually goes up as the firm's output increases all right and that is a bad thing all right so that's the that's the gist of it so let's go back to the textbook now now we're going to delve a little deeper based on the textbook so we're coming down this is a textbook version of the graph that i just showed you we are showing uh the is u-shaped and they're showing point a we have economies of scale where the costs are going down as the output increases and then from point b up you have this economies of scale where the costs are increasing as output increases now economies of scale as i said are certain advantages that the firm gains from increasing their output now there are two types of economies of scale you have internal economies of scale and you have external economies of scale what exactly is internal so internal economies of scale is where the benefits to the firm originate from within the firm itself so the benefits the firm gets from increasing output are growing are becoming larger it actually exists it comes from within the firm itself whereas external i mean it's pretty much self-explanatory external economy economies of scale uh where the benefits given to the firm that originates outside the firm especially from neighboring firms so if a bunch of firms in the same area starts growing then that can benefit your firm also and we are going to look at some of that later on as we look at some of the advantages so let's go so internal economy of scale can be divided subdivided further into these headings marketing financial managerial research and development welfare technical and economies of labor economies in the use of labor so let's look at them individually what are some benefits a firm get from growing as it relates to marketing now for sure one of the advantages is that the firm can now buy things in bulk you can buy in bulk and when you buy in bulk that means that you are going to get reduction in your price so if you buy in bulk the overall unit price is going to be reduced so buying in bulk is a good thing and that can only be kind of come on as the firm's output increases so that's one advantage that they gain from the marketing perspective another another one would be the fact that as a firm grows they can actually let's look at walmart for example walmart is a giant and as such walmart can actually determine um can actually influence its suppliers now as a firm grows you can influence what the suppliers do because a small firm basically have to answer to the suppliers you need them more than they need you but as you grow all of a sudden you realize that the suppliers now need you more than you need them because you have so many after you and your business again we're looking at walmart amazon and those big uh, companies but walmart in particular because they are the ones who kind of you know deals in in um like agricultural products customers customer consumer goods those things so those are two advantages you get from in, from a marketing perspective as it relates to internal economies of scale one you can now buy in bulk and it's cheaper two you can now influence your suppliers you can even get price redu reduction because you are the ones who can 
uh, talk to the suppliers and tell them, okay, look, this might be a little too high, bring it down because I have somebody else willing and able to supply the same thing at cheaper. Also, you when it come, comes around advertising, as a firm gets bigger, your name is synonymous, your name is more out there, and so therefore, advertising can become basically cheaper because you're going to advertise, the, your budget would go further. If you look at these things, companies like uh KFC and McDonald's and those franchises, they are huge. And so, if you might have one in your island, and if you see a commercial on TV for one based in America, automatically you think about the one home, so that's marketing for them without even them trying. So those are three ways in which economies of scale can benefit from a marketing perspective. Now financial, now straight up, if a firm is small, banks are less willing to lend money to that firm. Now, as the firm grows, you become bigger, you know, you might become too big to fail, you might be more influential. Now, banks willing to lend you money because you're bigger now, because the risk at lending you money now has fallen. You're a big company now, so now you can call some shots as it relates to who represents you as a, as a financial agent. Also, some firms, as they get bigger, they can now be uh, placed on the stock market. They can be public, uh, publicly traded companies. And as such, they can gain, uh, people might want to buy shares in the company, and so you can raise capital easier that way. So those are advantages you get from a financial perspective. One, banks are willing to lend you money quicker because they see you as less of a risk than a smaller company. And two, you can now sell your shares on like the public stock exchange. What about managerial advantages you get from growing? Managerial economies of scale, right here. Now, this is, again, self-explanatory, but we're going to treat it either way. Now, as a firm gets bigger, you can hire more and more employers, including more and more middle managers. So now what they're saying is that the firm has more managers spread across it, so you have somebody there to basically see to it the day-to-day runnings of the business more effectively. You don't have one manager who is stretched too thin, like one manager in charge of, like, a uh, hundred persons. No, you can break down that further. You're going to have the upper management who answers to maybe just the boss. Then you have middle management who has to answer to the big manager, but middle management is now less. All right, so you can break down the management responsibilities among more workers as your firm gets bigger. A next advantage is that now you can invest in what you call research and development as the firm gets bigger and bigger and they are more efficient in their, their, their areas now they can take it on themselves to now conduct their own research if you look at firms like google and amazon when they were small they never used to venture in certain things google started as a search engine and an ad firm but as Google got bigger and bigger, now they are doing research in driverless cars. They are doing research in wearables. Now we see Google all into hardware. They're making the Pixel phone. They're making Chromebooks. Now they, they did their research for those things. Because now they're bigger, they can expand and do research into other things. Amazon, the same thing. Amazon was an online store for books. Now Amazon has gotten so big that Amazon have done research in... Uh, they make their own phones. Amazon actually own a lot of web services. They own a lot of cloud programming. And I mean, a lot of cloud software. Amazon is a giant, and they have their hands in a lot of different things. Back to Google again. Google have their hands in so many things. They had to rename their company to Alphabet, and now they branch off in a lot of things. You have YouTube. You have Google, as in the search engine. You have the the hardware part of it. So what I'm getting at is that as a firm gets bigger they can now spend more money in the research department. Then you have the wealthy economies of scale. What does that mean? Now, as the firm gets larger, now, again, I'm going to use Google as an example again. If you go to a campus, or even Apple, Apple go to a, you go to Apple campus or Google campus, you see all kind of fancy things because though they are so big, they can actually take care of the workers. So they have recreation rooms, they have canteens for the... Um, cafeterias for food for, for, for their workers, they have um, tra subsidized meals, they have transportation, all kind of fancy things, extra, all kind of extra things now they can do to help the welfare of their workers. They have areas we can sleep if you're tired, you have places we can go and just meditate, yoga, all those kind of things because you're such a big firm now, you have so much money that you can actually, actually cater to the welfare of your workers. 
And of course, you have technical economies of scale where as certain firms get larger, they can now fully utilize certain equipment. Like for example, if you were running a printing um, shop, you would buy a big, big printer, but you know, sometimes you get little small jobs at first. But as you go into that machine, now all of a sudden you can fully utilize that machine and get big jobs as your output increase and you maximize the output of that machine. So that's when you're talking about technical economies of scale. Certain type of machinery come in fixed size. A small firm might only utilize such a machine. And then as it gets older, you can now fully maximize the utility of that machine. Then you have economies in the use of labor. Now, as a firm employs more labor, greater division of labor is possible, meaning that you can divide your workforce into different tasks, into smaller tasks. This leads to greater productivity and increased output. Division of labor will be discussed greater in detail in later chapter. All right, good. So those are the internal economies of scale, the advantages a firm get from within, from internal. Now, what about external economies of scale now? Now, there's some advantages you get from external to the company, such as improved infrastructure. Uh, I'll give an example. When uh, back in the day, when Ford made the first Model T, the first um, car in like 1901 or something like that, before that, the roads in America were terrible. But after Ford started growing and outputting more and more cars, the government realized that they need to fix the roads, and so they made proper roads to accommodate the new cars. Same way, large firms might induce local governments to improve roads, bridges, and general infrastructure. All firms in the area will benefit. So, as the firm gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that might cause the government to invest in infrastructure to basically accommodate that firm. So, if you realize that a firm is bringing more and more uh, people and business and stuff like that, you might want to, you know, upgrade the lighting, improve the parking system, improve the transportation because this big firm is bringing business to the local neighborhood or to the county or wherever. Then you have agglomeration, agglomeration, all right? Agglomeration, meaning large firms might encourage related firms to set up nearby. Now, a good example of this is in America again, or maybe in some of our countries where we have industrial parks. In America, you have what you call Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, a lot of tech firms just pop up around Silicon Valley. All right? A lot of firms, you have what you call angel investors, so you have a lot of Google money out there. So Google always on the lookout for small companies coming up. So a lot of firms are going to locate in that area in hopes of getting scooped up by Google or in hopes of utilizing Google to, you know, basically provide certain services like a lot of restaurants and stuff would come and show up in that area to accommodate a lot of traffic. But the main thing here is to focus on a place like, again, Silicon Valley where a lot of firms around that area are all tech driven. So Uber and Lyft and a lot of tech-driven firms would go in Silicon Valley. Then you have labor, all right? The, 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 the clustering of firms encourage the development of a skilled pool of labor. Workers trained by one firm might shift to another firm. Again, a good example, again, would be like Silicon Valley. A lot of people in Silicon Valley have, diff, have similar training in, different, in, 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 in the same areas. For example, somebody can work for Apple, Somebody can work for Google. They can leave Apple, go to Google, and ain't really miss a step. And it happens all the time. These companies always trade CEOs. You see a CEO move from Visa, gone to Mastercard. A CEO move from HP, gone to IBM. So they already so the labor pool around their area develops for that specific uh, enterprise, that specific industry. Then you have use of waste products. Some firms might use the other firm's waste or byproducts in their production process. These firms benefit by locating close to the firm that produces the waste product. Again, self-explanatory. If you are engaging in a certain venture and you have offshoots from that venture, then firms will pop up around that firm to benefit from the byproducts of that firm. I, for example, there are a lot of firms that, you know, do engage in uh, petrochemicals and then you see firms pop around that would, you know, cosmetics and stuff that would use the petrochemical in the um, offshoots to make their own products. So that's, again, 
you know, you pop up around where the use ma the waste material is, so you can save you on transportation costs and those things. You don't have to collect the waste material from here, travel a couple of miles to do your production. No, you do it in the same area. Now we come to the downside of becoming a grown-up large firm. This economies of scale, and again, we said that that's where the firm experience. A uh, rise in the total average cost as output increases in the long run. So as a firm continues to grow, this economy of scale set in. This economy of scale are disadvantages that result from the ongoing growth of the organization. So whereas economies of scale are advantages the firm get from growing, this economies of scale is the disadvantages the firm get from growing in the long run. And that disadvantage is the fact that the average cost of production rises. That's not a good thing. When the average total cost, average variable cost rises, that's what you call this economies of scale. All right, so let's go. What can happen here in this economies of scale? First one, first disadvantage, as this, the downside to this economies of scale. Loss of managerial control. This one is a clear cut one. As the firm grows, then it might become more difficult to actually manage that firm. Coordinating becomes an issue. You might be stretched, to one manager might be in charge of too many persons, you might be stretched too thin. Companies large like Apple and Microsoft and Google have so many layers of management that sometimes they don't even know who your real boss is. So that's one disadvantage. For one, management becomes an issue, and of course, communication becomes a major problem. No communication, no shutdown. All of a sudden, you, you can't even go in the boss door. You, you know, they must, might, might have had an open door policy, but as you know, grow up, boss move upstairs to the 10th floor, 15th floor, whatever floor. You can't talk to the boss as it used to before communication start breaking down. So, two things: loss of managerial control, and of course, com one of the problem is communication has been lost so that is a major problem another problem is that you might be too bogged down in red tape and bureaucracy because you have so many middle managers so so many middle managers you might even know who your real boss is one person might tell you to do this then the next one tell you to do that and then you confuse so all so communication basically breaks down and managerial uh, prowess basically control breaks down as the firm gets larger then you have poor industrial relations as the company grows, workers become isolated from the management. This can, for example, lead to half-hearted working, poor quality of output, work stoppages and strikes as workers do not have a voice in the decision-making process. So, the workers feel left out of the decision-making process. The company might just release a memo, a bulletin, something to instruct workers, hey, you have to, this is what you have to do, and you have no choice. That is not good for morale, and so therefore that might lead to poor industrial relation where it's them versus us you know the, 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 the rank and file against the upper management and things like that that's not that's not a good thing okay upper management may come out of touch with the rank and file workers and as such you know they feel as though management don't care they don't care about us we just like slaves they just see doing hard work and nobody appreciative of us so that might lead to that might be a, a, a symptom of this economies of scale and then you have what you call Yes, it's a real thing. Over specialization. We because output increase and the firm is growing, the individuals that were specializing in a certain area now becomes too specialized in that area and as such it leads to things like boredom and reduced quality of work. Guy be doing the same thing every day, every day, every day. You know, you become monotonous, you become bored, you want to your brain basically turn off. You work in autopilot on a daily basis. That is not a good thing. Okay, and as such, you know, that's what one of the downsides of you know growing and encountering these economies of scale. All right, so those are the problems associated with these economies of scale, and those are the advantages that are linked to economies of scale. Now, you might ask, what causes economies of scale, and what causes these economies of scale? We explained some of it. But one of the key causes would be this right here. All right, if you read this carefully, here's what it says. Economies of scale occurs when increasing production allows greater specialization. What that means, workers more efficient when focusing on a narrow task. 
So that's how you, 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 that's how economies of scale occurs. When you realize specialization is taking place, workers are becoming more efficient so they can produce more things in a shorter span of time. So therefore, output is increasing the more the person specialized. Because if you know how to do something with the eyes closed, then you're going to be so good at your work. You know, one, knock off one, knock off two, knock off three. Because you're so good at it. Therefore, output, you become more efficient. Output increases with the same, from the same person. So that's efficiency like right there. Productivity rises because you specialize. This economies of scale, on the other hand, is due to coordination problems in large organization. Example, management becomes stretched and can't control costs. So that's how the costs start rising up. Management is stretched too thin and they cannot control the costs. So a econ econ economies of scale occurs when increasing production allows greater specialization. For example, workers are more efficient and so productivity rises and so output rises and then you have costs going down and you have this, I mean, economies of scale, costs going down because you're efficient, you know how to do it, no wastage, nothing, so costs going down. This economies of scale, on the other hand, is due to coordination issues where you have such stretch communication, such stretch management controls that you can't really control the cost of certain things. Sometimes projects happen and you can't control it effectively and you overspend on the budget and stuff like that. So that's a bad thing right there. So that's basically it for economy, economies of scale and this economies of scale. So let's go back to the syllabus and see what we have covered thus far. So we have covered the concept of economies of scale. We looked at technical, marketing, financial, managerial, and risk-bearing economies. We also looked at how control and communication becomes a problem due to this economies of scale. And we looked at uh, diminishing returns to scale. Now, what is diminishing returns to scale? Now, this is the next concept that you might need to know. Now, what this refers to is the fact that, let's give me, let me give an example to explain. The best way to explain it is with an example. So, let's say you increase your input of labor and capital by 20% you know, in production. But your output decreases by, let's say, 10%. Now, that's it. that is diminishing returns to scale, where you're increasing your output in a proportion but you, sorry, your increasing input, the proportion of your increasing input is less than the actual proportion of the output. So you're increasing by 50%, but your output is like 25%. So that's what diminishing return to scale refers to, where your output is less than your input in a proportional way. All right, so that's basically it. Now, so yes, yeah, so we have covered um, objective 13 in uh, section 2 of the econ syllabus and so we have come to the end of that and so the next time we're looking at an economic economics video would be discussing section 3 all right so what you're supposed to do now is you're supposed to like you're supposed to subscribe and you are supposed to click the notification bell so that you know when learn skn has dropped another video uh, we are also currently working on some past paper videos so check those out for a lot of pob past papers will be going up as we have pob in january so you have to prepare for the january exam time and we're going to do some past papers for other subjects coming on later to the jan the june july exams so again like subscribe and please share with your friends don't be selfish don't be greedy share with your friends so that we can spread the sister club all right so that's it for now